Gwendolyn Brooks. She doesn't wear costume jewelry, and she knew that Walt Disney was, is making a fortune off false eyelashes, and that Time Magazine is the authority on the Negro. Her makeup is total real. A Negro English instructor called her a fine Negro poet. A white critic says she's a credit to the Negro race. Somebody else called her a pure Negro writer. Johnny May, who's a senior in high school, said, she and Lincoln are the only Negro poems we read in school, and I can understand her. Pee Wee used to carry one of her poems around in his back pocket. The one about being cool? That was before Pee Wee was cool by a cop's warning shot. Into the 60s, a word was born, black. And with black came poets. And from the poets' ball points came black, double black, purple black, blue black. Ben Black was black day before yesterday. Blacker than, ultra black, super black, black black, yellow black, nigger black, black white man, blacker than you ever bees. One fourth black, unblack, cold black, clear black, my mama's blacker than your mama. Pimple black, fall black, so black we can't even see you. Black on black, in black, by black, technically black, man tan black, winter black, cold black, 360 degrees black, cold black, midnight black, black when it's convenient, rusty black, moon black. Star black, summer black, electron black, spaceman black, shoe shine black, gym shoe black, underwear black, ugly black, aunt your mama's black, uncle Ben's rice black, Willie best black, black is beautiful black, I just discovered black, negro black, unsubstance black. And everywhere the lady negro poet appeared, the poets were there. They listened and questioned and went home feeling uncomfortable, unsound, and so untogether. They read, reread, wrote, and rewrote, and came back the next time to tell the lady Negro poet how beautiful she was, is, and how she had helped them. And she came back with how necessary they were and how they have helped her. The poets walked, and as space filled the vacuum between them and the lady Negro poet, you could hear one of the black poets say, Bruh, they've been called that sister by the wrong name. Kitchenette Building. We are things of dry hours and the involuntary plan. Grayed in and gray. Dream makes a giddy sound, not strong like rent. Feeding a wife, satisfying a man. But could a dream send up through onion fumes its white and violet? Fight with fried potatoes and yesterday's garbage ripening in the hall. Flutter or sing an aria down these rooms? Even if we were willing to let it in, had time to warm it, keep it very clean, anticipate a message, let it begin. We wonder, but not well, not for a minute. Since number five is out of the bathroom now, we think of lukewarm water, hope to get in it. obituary for a living lady. My friend was decently wild as a child, and as a young girl, she was interested in a brooch and pink powder and a curl. As a young woman, though, she fell in love with a man who didn't know that even if she wouldn't let him touch her breasts, she was still worth his hours, stopped calling Sundays with flowers. Sunday after Sunday, she put on her clean, gay, the white dress worried the windows. There was so much silence, she finally decided that the next time she would say yes. But the man had found by then a woman who dressed in red. My friend spent a hundred weeks or so wishing she were dead. But crying for yourself when you give it all of your time gets tedious after a while. Therefore, she terminated her mourning made for her mouth a sad, sweet smile, and discovered the country of God. Now she will not dance, and she thinks not the thinnest thought of any type of romance, and I can't get her to take a touch of the best cream cologne. However, even without lipstick, she is lovely, and it is no wonder that the preacher, at present, is almost a synonym for her telephone and watches the neutral, kind, bland eyes that moisten the first pew center on Sunday, I beg your pardon, Sabbath nights, and wonders as his stomach breaks up into fire and lights, 
how long it will be before he can, with reasonably slight risk of rebuke, put his hand on her knee. Sadie and Maud. Maud went to college. Sadie stayed at home. Sadie scraped life with a fine tooth comb. She didn't leave a tangle in. Her comb found every strand. Sadie was one of the livingest chits in all the land. Sadie bore two babies under her maiden name. Maud and Ma and Papa nearly died of shame. When Sadie said her last so long, her girl struck out from home. Sadie had left as heritage her fine tooth comb. Maud, who went to college, is a thin brown mouse. She is living all alone in this old house. Matthew Cole. Here are the facts. He's 66. He rooms in a stove-heated flat over on Lafayette. He has roomed there 10 years long. He never will be done with dust and his ceiling that is everlasting sad and the gloomy housekeeper who forgets to build the fire, and the red fat roaches that stroll unafraid up his wall, and the whiteless grin of the housekeeper on Saturday night when he pays his four dollars, the ceaseless Sunday row of her big cheap radio. She'll tell you he is the pleasantest man, always a smile, a smile, but in the door locked dirtiness of his room. He never smiles, except when come, say, thoughts of a little boy licorice full without a nickel for Sunday school, or thoughts of a little boy playing ball and swearing at sound of his mother's call. Once, I think, he laughed aloud at thought of a wonderful joke he'd played on the whole crowd, the old crowd. The vacant lot. Mrs. Coley's three flat brick isn't here anymore. All done with seeing her fat little form burst out of the basement door, and with seeing her African son in law, rightful heir to the throne, with his great white strong coal squares of teeth and his little eyes of stone, and with seeing the squat fat daughter letting in the men when majesty has gone for the day and letting them out again. Queen of the Blues. Mame was singing at the Midnight Club and the place was red with blues. She could shake her body across the floor for what did she have to lose? She put her mama under the ground two years ago. Was it three? She covered that grave with roses and tears a handsome thing to see. She didn't have any legal pa to glare at her to shame her off the floor of the midnight club. Poor Mame. She didn't have any big brother to shout, no sister of mine. She didn't have any small brother to think she was everything fine. She didn't have any baby girl with velvet pop open eyes. She didn't have any sunny boy to tell sweet sunny boy lies. Show me a man what will love me till I die. Now show me a man what will love me till I die. Can't find no such a man, no matter how hard you try. Go long, baby, ain't a true man left in chai. I loved my daddy, but what did my daddy do? I loved my daddy, but what did my daddy do? Found him a brown-skinned chicken, what's gonna be black and blue. I was good to my daddy, gave him all my dough. I say I was good to my daddy, I gave him all of my dough. Scrubbed hard in them white folks' kitchens till my knees was rusty and so. The MC hollered, Queen of the Blues. Folks, this is strictly the Queen of the Blues. She snapped her fingers, she rolled her hips, what did she have to lose? But a thought ran through her like a fire. Men don't tip their hats to me. 
They pinch my arms and they slap my thighs. But when has a man tipped his hat to me? Queen of the blues, queen of the blues. Strictly, strictly, the queen of the blues. Men are low down, dirty and mean. Why don't they tip their hats to a queen? The mother. Abortions will not let you forget. You remember the children you got that you did not get. The damp, small pulps with a little or with no hair. The singers and workers that never handled the air. You will never neglect or beat them or silence or buy with a sweet. You will never wind up the sucking thumb or scuttle off ghosts that come. You will never leave them controlling your luscious sigh. Return for a snack of them with gobbling mother eye. I have heard in the voices of the wind the voices of my dim killed children. I have contracted I have eased my dim dears at the breast they could never suck. I have said, sweets, if I sinned, if I seized your luck and your lives from your unfinished reach, if I stole your births and your names, your straight baby tears and your games, your stilted or lovely loves, your tumults, your marriages, aches, and your death, if I poison the beginnings of your breaths, believe that even in my deliberateness I was not deliberate, though why should I whine, whine that the crime was other than mine, since anyhow you are dead, or rather, or instead, you were never made. But that too, I am afraid, is faulty. Oh, what shall I say? How is the truth to be said? You were born, you had body, you died. It is just that you never giggled or planned or cried. Believe me, I loved you all. Believe me, I knew you, though faintly, and I loved, I loved you all. The Sundays of Satin Leg Smith. Inamoratus, with an approbation, bestowed his title, blessed his inclination. He wakes, unwinds elaborately, a cat tawny, reluctant, royal. He is fat and fine this morning, definite, reimbursed. He waits a moment, he designs his reign that no performance may be, then rises in a, he sheds with his pajamas, shabby days, and his desertedness, his intricate fear, the postponed resentments, and the prim precautions. Now at his bath, would you deny him lavender or take away the power of his pine? What smelly substitute, heady as wine, would you provide? Life must be aromatic. There must be scent. Somehow there must be some. Would you have flowers in his life? Suggest asters, a really good geranium? A white carnation? Would you prescribe a show with the coal lilies, formal chrysanthemum magnificence, poinsettias, and emphatic red of prize roses? Might his happiest alternative, you muse, be after all a bit of gentle garden in the best of taste and straight tradition? Maybe so. But you forget, or did you ever know, his heritage of cabbage and pigtails, old intimacy with alleys, garbage pails, down in the deep, but always beautiful, south, where roses blush their blithest, it is said, and sweet magnolias put Chanel to shame. No, he has not a flower to his name, except a feather one for his lapel. Apart from that, if he should think of flowers, it is in terms of dandelions or death. Ah, there is little hope. You might as well, unless you care to set the world aboil and do a lot of equalizing things, remove a little ermine, say, from kings, shake hands with paupers and appoint them men, for instance. Certainly, you might as well 
leave him his lotion, lavender, and oil. Let us proceed, let us inspect, together with his meticulous and serious love, the innards of this closet, which is a vault whose glory is not diamonds, not pearls, not silver plate with just enough dull shine, but wonder suits in yellow and in wine, sarcastic green and zebra-striped cobalt, with shoulder padding that is wide and cocky and determined as his pride, ballooning pants that taper off to ends, scheduled to choke precisely. Here are hats like bright umbrellas and hysterical ties like narrow banners for some gathering war. People are so in need, in need of help. People want so much that they do not know. Below the tinkling trade of little coins, the gold impulse not possible to show or spend, promise piled over and betrayed. These needed limbs receive the kiss of silk. Then they receive the brave and beautiful embrace of some of that equivocal wool. He looks into his mirror, loves himself. The neat curve here, the angularity that is appropriate at just its place, the technique of a variegated grace. Here is all his sculpture and his art and all his architectural design. Perhaps you would prefer to this a fine value of marble, complicated stone, would have him think with horror of Baroque Rococo. You forget and you forget. He dances down the hotel steps that keep remnants of last night's high life and distress as spat out purchased kisses and spilled beer. He swallows sunshine with a secret yelp, passes to coffee and a roll or two, has breakfasted. Out, sounds about him smear, become a unit. He hears and does not hear the alarm clock meddling in somebody's sleep. Children's governed Sunday happiness, the dry tone of a plane, a woman's oath, consumption, spiritless expectoration, an indignant robin's resolute donation, pinching a track through apathy and din, restaurant vendors weeping, and the L that comes on like a slightly horrible thought. Pictures, too, as usual, are blurred. He sees and does not see the broken windows hiding their shame with newsprint. Little girl, with ribbons decking wornness, little boy wearing the trousers with the decentest patch to honor Sunday, women on their way from service, temperate holiness arranged ably on asking faces, men estranged from music and from wonder and from joy, but far familiar with the guiding awe of foodlessness. He loiters, restaurant vendors weep or out of them rolls a restless glee. The lonesome blues, the long lost blues, I want a big fat mama. Down these sore avenues comes no sasa, no piquant elusive Grieg, and not Tchaikovsky's wayward eloquence, and not the shapely tender drift of Brahms. But could he love them? Since a man must bring to music what his mother spanked him for when he was two, bits of forgotten hate, devotion, whether or not his mattress hurts, the little dream his father humored, the thing his sister did for money, what he ate for breakfast, and for dinner 20 years ago last autumn, all his skipped desserts. The pasts of his ancestors lean against him, crowd him, fog out his identity. Hundreds of hungers mingle with his own. Hundreds of voices advise so dexterously he quite considers his reactions his. Judges he walks most powerfully alone. That everything is simply what it is. But movie time approaches. Time to boo the hero's kiss and boo the heroine whose ivory and yellow it is sin for his eye to eat of. The Mickey Mouse, however, 
is for everyone in the house. Squires his lady to dinner at Joe's Eats. His lady alters as to leg and eye, thickness and height, such minor points as these, from Sunday to Sunday. But no matter what her name or body, positively she's in queen lace stockings with ambitious heels that strain to kiss the calves and vivid shoes, frontless and backless, Chinese fingernails, earrings, three layers of lipstick, intense hat dripping with the most voluble of veils. Her affable extremes are like sweet bombs about him, whom no middle grace or good could gratify. He had no education in quiet arts of compromise. He would not understand your counsels on control, nor thank you for your late trouble. At Joe's Eats, you get your fish or chicken on meat platters with coleslaw, macaroni, candied sweets, coffee, and apple pie. You go out full. The end is, isn't it, all that really matters. And even and intrepid come the tender boots of night to home. Her body is like new brown bread under the Woolworth mignonette. Her body is a honey bowl whose waiting honey is deep and hot. Her body is like summer earth, receptive, soft, and absolute. The parents, people like our marriage, Maxie and Andrew, clogged and soft and sloppy eyes have lost the light that bites or terrifies. There are no swans and swallows anymore. The people settled for chicken and shut the door. But one by one, they got things done. Watch for porches as you pass and prim low fencing, pinching in the grass. Pleasant custard sit behind the white Venetian blind. Do not be afraid of no. Do not be afraid of no who has so far, so very far to go. New caution to occur to one whose inner scream set her to seed for softer lapping and smooth fur, whose esoteric need was merely to avoid the nettle, to not bleed, stupid like a street that beats into a dead end and dies there with nothing left to reprimand or meet and like a candle fixed against dismay and countershine of mixed wild moon and sun, and like a flying furniture or bird with lattice wing or gaunt thing, a stammer down a nightmare neon peopled with condor, hawk, and shrike. To say yes is to die a lot or a little. The dead wear capably their wry, enameled emblems. They smell, but that, and that they do not altogether yell, is all that we know well. It is brave to be involved, to be not fearful, to be unresolved. Her new wish was to smile when answers took no airships, walked a while. Pygmies are pygmies still, though perched on Alps, Edward Young. But can see better there, and laughing there, pity the giants wallowing on the plain. Giants who bleat and chafe in their small grass, seldom to spread the palm, to spit, come clean. Pygmies expand in cold, impossible air. Cry fie on giant shine, poor glory, which pounds breastbone punily, screeches, and has reached no Alps, or knows no Alps to reach. The rights for Cousin Vit carried her unprotesting out the door, kicked back the casket stand, but it can't hold her that stuff and satin 
aiming to enfold her, the lid's contrition nor the bolts before. Oh, oh, too much, too much. Even now, surmise, she rises in the sunshine. There she goes, back to the bar she knew, and the repose in love rooms and the things in people's eyes. Too vital and too squeaking must emerge. Even now she does the snake hips with a hiss, slops the bad wine across her shantum, talks of pregnancy, guitars and bridge work, walks in parks or alleys, comes haply on the verge of happiness, haply hysterics, is. Leaves from a loose leaf war diary, thousands killed in action. You need the untranslatable ice to watch. You need to loiter a little among the vague hushes, the clever evasions of the vagueness above the healthy energy of decay. You need the untranslatable ice to watch, the purple and black to smell, before your horror can be sweet or proper, before your grief is other than discreet. The intellectual dam will nurse your half hurt. Quickly you are well, but weary. How you yawn have yet to see why nothing exhausts you like this sympathy. The certainty we two shall meet by God in a wide parlor underneath a light of lights come sometime is no ointment now because we two are worshipers of life, being young, being masters of the long-legged stride, gypsy arm swing. We never did learn how to find white in the Bible. We want nights of vague adventure, lips lax wet and warm, bees in the stomach, sweat across the brow, now. My little bout town gal, Roger of Rhodes. My little bout town gal has gone, bout town with powder and blue dye on her pale lids and on her lips, dye sits quite carminly. I'm scarcely healthy hearted or human. What can I teach my cheated woman? My tondaleo, my black blonde, will not be homing soon. None shall secure her, save the light, the detective fingers of the moon. The bean eaters. They eat beans mostly, this old yellow pear. Dinner is a casual affair. Plain chipware on a plain and creaking wood. Tin flatware. Two who are mostly good. Two who have lived their day, but keep on putting on their clothes and putting things away. And remembering, remembering with twinklings and twinges as they lean over the beans in their rented back room that is full of beads and receipts and dolls and cloths, tobacco crumbs, vases and fringes. Oh, Mary, my last defense is the present tense. It little hurts me now to know I shall not go cathedral hunting in Spain, nor cherrying in Michigan or Maine. The lovers of the poor arrive. The ladies from the Ladies' Betterment League arrive in the afternoon the light light slanting in diluted gold bars across the boulevard brag of proud, seamed faces with mercy and murder hinting here, there, interrupting all deep and debonair the pink paint on the innocence of fear. Walk in a gingerly manner up the hall. 
cutting with knives served by their softest care, served by their love so barbarously fair, whose mothers taught, you'd better not be cruel, you had better not throw stones upon the wrens. Herein they kiss and coddle and assault anew and dearly in the innocence with which they baffle nature, who are full, sleek, tender clad, fit, fifty-ish, aglow, all sweetly abortive, hinting at fat fruit, judge it high time that fifty-ish fingers felt beneath the lovelier planes of enterprise. To resurrect, to moisten with milky chill, to be a random hitching post or plush, to be, for wet eyes, random and handy hem. Their guild is giving money to the poor, the worthy poor, the very, very worthy and beautiful poor, perhaps just not too swarthy, perhaps just not too dirty, nor too dim, nor passionate. In truth, what they could wish is something less than derelict or dull, not staunch enough to stab, though, gaze for gaze. God shield them sharply from the beggar bold, the noxious, needy ones whose battles bawl, nonetheless for being voiceless, hits one down. But it's also bad and entirely too much for them. The stench, the urine, cabbage, and dead beans, dead porridges of assorted dusty grains, the old smoke, heavy diapers, and they're told something called chitterlings, the darkness, drawn darkness or dirty light, the soil that stirs, the soil that looks the soil of centuries, and for that matter, the general oldness, Old wood, old marble, old tile, old, old, old. Not home kind oldness, not Lake Forest, Glencoe. Nothing is sturdy, nothing is majestic. There is no quiet drama, no rubbed glaze, no unkillable infirmity of such a tasteful turn as lately they have left. Glencoe, Lake Forest, and to which their cars must presently restore them when they're done with dullards and distortions of this fistic patience of the poor and put upon. They've never seen such a make-do-ness as newspaper rugs before in this, this flat. Their hostess is gathering up the oozed, the rich rugs of the morning, tattered, the bespattered, readies to spread clean rugs for afternoon. Here is a scene for you. The ladies look in horror behind a substantial citizeness whose trains clank out across her swollen heart, who arms akimbo almost fills a door. All tumbling children, quilts dragged to the floor and tortured thereover, potato peelings, soft-eyed kitten, hunched up, haggard, to be hurt. Their league is allotting largest to the lost, but to put their clean, their pretty money, to put their money collected from delicate rose fingers tipped with their hundred flawless rose nails, seems. They own spode, low stuffed, candelabra, mantles and hostess gowns, and sunburst clocks, turtle soup, Chippendale, red satin hangings, Obasans and Hattie Carnegie, they winter in Palm Beach, cross the water in June, attend, when suitable, the nice art institute, buy the right books and the best bindings, saunter on Michigan Easter mornings in sun or wind. Oh, squalor, this sick four-story hulk, this fiber with fissures everywhere. Why, what are bringings? of loath love largesse. What shall peril hunger so old, old? What shall flatter the desolate? Blocked fire escape and chitterling and swaggering seeking youth and the puzzled wreckage of the middle stale shames and again the porridges of the underslung and children, children, children. Heavens, that was a rat, surely, off there in the shadows, long and long tail gray, 
the ladies from the Ladies' Betterment League agree it will be better to achieve the outer air that writes and steadies, to hie to a house that does not holler, to ring bells else tang, better presently to cater to no more possibilities, to get away. Perhaps the money can be posted. Perhaps they too may choose another slum, some serious sooty half unhappy home where loath love likelier may be invested. Keeping their scented bodies in the center of the hall as they walk down the hysterical hall, they allow their lovely skirts to graze no wall, are off at what they manage of a canter, and resuming all the clues of what they were, try to avoid inhaling the laden air. a man of the middle class. I'm what has gone out blithely and with noise returning. I'm what rushed around to pare down rind to find fruit frozen under there. I am bedraggled with sundry dust to be shed, trailing desperate tarnished tassels, these strident aprils with terrifying polkas and bugle calls confound me. Although I've risen, and my back is bold, my tongue is brainy, choosing from among care, rage, surprise, despair, and choosing care. I'm semi-splendid within what I've defended. Yet there I totter, there limp laxly, my uncomely trudge to plateau that and platitudinous plateau, whichever, is no darling to my grudge-choked industry or usual alcohol. I've roses to guard in the architectural prettiness of my yard, but there are no paths remarkable for wide, believable welcomes. I have loved directions. I have loved orders and an iron to stride. I, whose hands are papers now, fit only for tossing in this outrageous air. Not God, nor grace, nor candy balls will get me everything different and the same. My wife has canvas walls. My wife never quite forgets to put flowers in vases, bizarre prints in the most unusual places, give teas for poets, wear odoriferous furs, and awful blooming is hers. I've antique firearms, black amours, Chinese rugs, ivories, bronzes, everything I wanted. But have I answers? Oh, methinks I've answers such as have the executives I copied long ago, the ones who, forfeiting Vic Sav, prayer book, and mother, shot themselves last Sunday, all forsaking all that was theirs but for their money's taking. I've answers such as giants used to know. There's a giant who'll jump next Monday, all forsaking, wives, safes, and solitaire, and the elegant statue standing at the foot of the stair. Kid Bruin arranges another title defense. I rode into the golden yell of the hollow land of fame, and when I mentioned Rainbow, they did not know the name, but thought it might have been there, and overnight have hide adding that nothing in that land could be trapped or tied, trapped or tied or kissed for good or bound about the hand. They could not swear to rainbow in that hollow land. The Ghost at the Quincy Club. All filmy down she drifts in filmy stuffs and all. Some gentle Gentile girl wafts down our Quincy Hall. This was a mansion once with polished panels and all, where velvet voices lessened, stopped, and rose, rise raucous howdies, and a curse comes pure. Yea, it comes pure and challenges again all ghost airs, graces, all daughters of gentlemen, moth soft, off sweet, demure where tea and father were, each clear and lemony, 
our dark folk drinking beer. Garbage man, the man with the orderly mind. What do you think of us in fuzzy endeavor, you whose directions are sterling, whose lunge is straight? Can you make a reason? How can you pardon us who memorize the rules and never score? Who memorize the rules from your own text but never quite transfer them to the game? Who never quite receive the whistling ball who gawk begin to absorb the crowd's own roar. Is earnestness enough? May earnestness attract or lead to light? Is light enough if hands in clumsy frenzy, flimsy whimsicality enlist? Is light enough when this bewilderment, crying against the dark, shuts down the shades? Dilute confusion, find and explode our mist. weaponed woman. Well, life has been a baffled vehicle and baffling, but she fights and has fought according to her lights and the lenience of her whirling place. She fights with semi-folded arms, her strong bag, and the stiff frost of her face that challenges when and if, and altogether she does rather well. Riot. A riot is the language of the unheard, Martin Luther King. John Cabot, out of Wilma, once a Wycliffe, all white blue rose below his golden hair, wrapped richly in right linen and right wool, almost forgot his Jaguar and Lake Bluff, almost forgot Grand Tully, which is the best thing that ever happened to Scotch almost forgot the sculpture at the Richard Gray and Distelheim, the kidney pie at Maxim's, the Grenadine de Boeuf at Maison Henri. Because the Negroes were coming down the street, because the poor were sweaty and unpretty, not like two dainty Negroes in Winneka, and they were coming toward him in rough ranks, in seas, in wind sweep. They were black and loud and not detainable and not discreet. Gross, gross, que tu es grossier, John Cabot itched instantly beneath the nourished white that told his story of glory to the world. Don't let it touch me, the blackness, Lord, he whispered to any handy angel in the sky. But in a thrilling announcement, on it drove and breathed on him and touched him. In that breath, the fume of pigfoot chittering and cheap chili malign mocked John. And in terrific touch, old averted doubt jerked forward decently, cried, Cabot, John, you are a desperate man, and the desperate die expensively today. John Cabot went down in the smoke and fire and broken glass and blood, and he cried, Lord, forgive these niggas that know not what they do. Gang girls are rangerette. Gang girls are sweet exotics. Mary Ann uses the nutrients of her Orient but sometimes sighs for cities of blue and jewel beyond her ranger rim of cottage grove. Bowery boys, disciples, whip birds will dissolve no margins, stop no savory sanctities. Mary is a rose in a whiskey glass. Mary's February's shudder and are gone. April's fret frankly, lilac hurries on. Summer is a hard, irregular ridge. October looks away. And that's the year, save for her bugle love, save for the bleat of not obese devotion, save for somebody terribly dying under the philanthropy of robins, save for her ranger bringing an amount of rainbow in a string-drawn bag. 
Where did you get the diamond? Do not ask, but swallow straight the spirals of his flask and assist him at your zipper. Pet his lips and help him clutch you. Love's another departure. Will there be any arrivals, confirmations? Will there be gleaning? Mary, the shake dancer's child from the rooming flat, pants carefully, peers at her laboring lover. Mary, Mary Ann, settle for sandwiches, settle for stocking caps, for sudden blood, aborted carnival, the props and niceties of non-loneliness, the rhymes of leaning. The wall, a drum, 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 humbly we come, south of success and east of gloss and glass, our sandals, flower cloth, grave hoops of wood or gold, pendant from black ears, brown ears, reddish brown, and ivory ears. Black boy men, black boy men on roofs, fist out black power, Val, a little black stampede in African images of brass and flower swirl, fists out black power, tightens pretty eyes, leans back on mother country and is tracked, is treatise through her perfect and tight teeth. Women in wool hair chant their poetry. Phil Coran gives us messages and music made of developed bone and polished and honed cult. It is the hour of tribe and of vibration, the day-long hour. It is the hour of ringing rowls of ferment festival. On 43rd and Langley, black furnaces resent ancient legislatures of ploy and scruple and practical gelatin. They keep the fever in, fondle the fever. All worship the wall. I mount the rattling wood. Walter says, she is good, says she our sister is. In front of me, hundreds of faces, red, brown, brown, black ivory, yield me hot trust, their yea and their announcement that they are ready to rile the high-flung ground. Behind me, paint, heroes. No child has defiled the heroes of this wall, this serious appointment, this still wing, this skull, this flute, this heavy light, this hinge. An emphasis is paroled. The old decapitations are revised the dispossessions beakless, and we sing. The Sermon on the Warpland. The fact that we are black is our ultimate reality, said Ron Karenga. And several strengths from drowsiness campaigned, but spoke in single sermon on the Warpland, and went about the Warpland saying, no, my people, black and black, Revile the river, say that the river turns, and turn the river. Say that our something in double pod contains seeds for the coming hell and health together. Prepare to meet, sisters, brothers, the brash and terrible weather, the pains, the bruising, the collapse of bestials, idols. But then, oh then, the stuffing of the halls, the seasoning of the perilously sweet, the help, the heralding of the clear obscure. Build now your church, my brothers, sisters, build never with brick nor quartan, nor with granite, build with lithe love, with love like lion eyes, with love like morning rise with love like black, our black, luminously indiscreet, complete, continuous. The children of the poor. People who have no children can be hard, attain a male of ice and insolence, need not pause in the fire 
and in no sense hesitate in the hurricane to guard. And when wide world is bitten and be warred, they perish purely, waving their spirits hence without a trace of grace or of offense to laugh or fail, diffident, wonder-starred. While through a throttling dark, we others hear the little lifting helplessness, the queer whimper whine, whose unridiculous lost softness softly makes a trap for us and makes a curse and makes a sugar of the malocclusions, the inconditions of love. What shall I give my children who are poor, who are adjudged the least wise of the land, who are my sweetest lepers, who demand no velvet and no velvety velour, but who have begged me for a brisk contour, crying that they are quasi, contraband because unfinished, graven by a hand less than angelic, admirable or sure. My hand is stuffed with mode design device, but I lack access to my proper stone, and plenitude of plan shall not suffice, nor grief nor love shall be enough alone to ratify my little halves who bear across an autumn freezing everywhere. And shall I prime my children pray to pray? Mites come invade most frugal vestibules, spectred with crusts of penitence renewals and all hysterics arrogant for a day. Instruct yourselves, here is no devil to pay. Children, confine your lights in jellied rules. Resemble graves, be metaphysical mules. Learn, Lord, will not distort nor leave the fray. Behind the scurryings of your neat motif, I shall wait, if you wish, Revise the psalm, if that should frighten you. Sew up belief, if that should tear. Turn, singularly calm, at forehead and at fingers rather wise, holding the bandage ready for your eyes. First fight, then fiddle. Ply the slipping string with feathery sorcery. Muzzle the note with hurting love. The music that they wrote bewitch, bewilder, qualify to sing threadwise, devise no salt, no hempen thing for the dear instrument to bear, devote the bow to silks and honey, be remote a while from malice and from murdering. But first, to arms, to armor, carry hate in front of you and harmony behind. Be deaf to music and to beauty blind. Win war, rise bloody, maybe not too late, for having first to civilize a space wherein to play your violin with grace. When my dears die, the festival colored brightness that is their motion and mild repartee enchanted, a macabre mockery charming the rainbow radiance into tightness, and into a remarkable politeness that is not kind and does not want to be. May not they in the crisp encounter see something to recognize and read as rightness? I say they may, so granitely discreet. The little crooked questionings in Belm concede themselves on most familiar ground, cold, an old predicament of the breath. Adroit, the shapely prefaces complete. Accept the university of death.